Today, I have about 50% of my net worth invested in real estate investment trusts or REITs in short. I invest so heavily in this sector because I think that REITs are today presenting a historic opportunity to buy real estate at a steep discount. There are some individual REITs that are priced at just half of their net asset values and that's because their share prices have crashed even as their rents kept on growing and their underlying properties remain more or less stable in value. I strongly believe that the market has overreacted to fears of rising interest rates, not understanding that REITs use little leverage, have long debt maturities, and their rent hikes more than make up for the surge in interest expense. So I'm very bullish on REITs, but even then I'm objective enough to recognize that not all REITs are worth buying, on the contrary there are quite a few that I would avoid at all costs. Hey everyone, this is Jules, I run a small investment firm that specializes in REIT investing and in today's video I'm going to talk to you about 5 types of REITs to avoid at all costs. But before I get into it, could you please do me a huge favor and click the like button that really helped me a lot to grow this channel. Thank you so much for your support. So the first type of REIT to avoid are the externally managed REITs. Today most REITs are managed internally and what this essentially means is that the management is hired as employees of the REIT and their salaries are then tied to some key performance indicators. To give you an example, here the compensation of the executives at Vichy Properties is tied to the growth in their FFO per share as well as the total returns enjoyed by shareholders. This does a great job at aligning the interests of the managers and the shareholders and this is why most REITs are today managed internally. But there are still quite many REITs that are today managed externally and what this means is that the management is outsourced to a separate asset management company that then takes care of the management in exchange of fees. This can lead to some very significant conflicts of interest because of two key reasons. Firstly, the manager will typically also manage some other vehicles with competing interest. As an example, they may take care of the management of a REIT, but also three other private vehicles that are targeting similar properties. Then you really need to ask yourself which vehicle is going to get fed the best deals and which one is going to get the average one or the worst ones. Moreover, because the attention of the manager is going to be spread out on many vehicles, the quality of the management may suffer as a result. And then the second issue here is that the compensation of an external manager will typically be tied to the volume of assets under management. And as a result, the manager is here going to be incentivized to grow the REIT as much as it can. Common behavior that we see from a lot of externally managed REITs is that they will keep on issuing a lot of shares to make acquisitions even if that's dilutive on a per share basis. It hurts shareholders but it benefits the manager because it leads to growing fee income for them. And so as a result of these conflicts of interest, externally managed REITs have historically done a lot worse than internally managed REITs and in some cases the difference can be very drastic. Some examples of externally managed REITs that I would avoid at all costs include Global Net Lease, Industrial Logistics Properties Trust, Office Properties Income Trust, Diversified Healthcare REIT and Service Properties Trust. All of these REITs are always priced at very low valuations, typically they offer very high dividend yields, but despite that they've done really poorly over the long run. So good rule of thumb here is that if a REIT is managed externally, probably stay away from it. There are some exceptions of good externally managed REITs that are worth buying, but if you're not an expert on REITs, probably just stick to internally managed REITs and you'll save yourself a lot of headaches. Then the second type of REIT that I tend to avoid are mortgage REITs. A lot of investors are attracted into them because of their high dividend yields. It's not uncommon for them to offer dividend yields in excess of 10%. Some examples that come to my mind are Anali Capital Management, Arbor Realty Trust or AGNC. But despite offering these very high dividend yields, mortgage rates have actually done really poorly on a total return basis over the long run. In fact, their track record is one of the worst in the entire financial sector, earning only about 2% average annual total returns. I believe that the reason why most mortgage REITs have done so poorly over the long run is because their businesses rely on unpredictable macro factors like the level of interest rates and spreads, which are completely out of their control. And what makes things even worse is that most mortgage REITs use a lot of leverage and as a result this leads to some boom and bust cycles. A great illustration of this is the dividend track record of Anali Capital Management. This is one of the best respected mortgage REITs and yet you'll see here that this REIT has consistently failed to predict the turns in the macro environment and this has led to many dividend cuts in the past. I would much rather invest in equity REITs like Vichy Properties and Realty Income and earn a lower dividend yield but enjoy a steady one that's growing over time. 
then I will also stay away from REITs that specialize in some specific property sectors. The most obvious one here is the office property sector. Office REITs are today heavily discounted and they're attracting a lot of value investors. But I think that if you adjust for the high need for capex, the high leverage, the expanding cap rate and the risk of a further drop in occupancy levels and rents, then in that case, these office rates actually aren't that cheap anymore. I myself run a small investment company and my entire team is fully remote. And while I don't expect everybody to go this route, I do think that hybrid work is here to stay. And this is going to have a profound and long lasting impact on the office sector. Therefore, I fear that some office rates like Boston properties are likely to turn into value traps. In a way, I feel like the office sector today is similar to the mall sector 5 to 10 years ago. Mall rates like Simon Property Group looked very cheap already back in 2017, but if you would have adjusted for the capex, the need to reinvest in the properties, these rates actually weren't that cheap and they end up turning into value traps. But it's not just offices that I'm staying away from. There are some other property sectors that I also dislike. Hotels, as an example, are too cyclical, they require a lot of capex, and they suffer from the growing competition from Airbnb and other similar platforms. I also think that self-storage is likely to face some pain in the coming years because I fear that this sector is overbuilt in the US. REITs like public storage and extra space storage have seen their share prices come down drastically, but even then I fear that this is going to be a rough space over the coming years. Then fourth, there are a lot of foreign REIT markets that you probably should avoid as well. Today, most REITs in the US are really well managed. They've existed for many decades, they are scrutinized by countless analysts, and they are regulated by the SEC. There are exceptions, of course, but most managers are well aligned with shareholders. But the same is not true for a lot of foreign markets. Right now, I'm in Asia to look for some Asian real estate investment opportunities to include into our international REIT portfolio at High Yield Landlord, which is my REIT newsletter. By the way, if you want to access our entire portfolio, feel free to join us for a two week free trial. I'll put a link to it in the description of this video. But unfortunately, what I've realized here in Asia is that most REITs are uninvestable simply because their managements are not aligned with shareholders. External management structures are still very common in Asia and REITs get away with things that they wouldn't get away with in the US. As an example, here there is this common practice of asset dumping by which a manager will develop properties in a separate entity and then sell these assets at an expensive price to their REITs. In my opinion, many of these related party transactions aim at transferring value from the REIT to the manager and this is all very shady and I would much rather avoid this type of situations. And then the fifth thing that I would avoid are REIT close and funds. Many investors are attracted by closed end funds because they offer very high dividend yields. The most popular one in the REIT sector is probably the Cohen and Steers Quality Income Realty Fund, sticker symbol is RQI. It offers a much higher dividend yield than what you would earn from an ETF like the Vanguard Real Estate ETF. But there are many reasons why I don't really like it. For one, the higher yield here is fake in a way because it's achieved by taking on a lot of debt and secondly by also investing in preferred equities which offer a higher yield but have less upside potential in a future recovery. Then the second issue is that they really charge high fees relative to ETFs. Then the third issue is what I call closet indexing. If you look at their top holdings, they're actually very similar to those of major REIT benchmarks and so I don't think that the active management is going to add a lot of value here. And then fourth, if you look at the track records of most close end funds, they're typically quite poor and RQI is no exception. Since going public, it has underperformed its passive benchmark and that's despite being a lot riskier as it's using a lot of leverage. In fact, RQI actually almost went bankrupt following the great financial crisis. And so historically, most of these read close end funds have actually generated lower returns with higher risk. Yes, you're getting a higher dividend yield, but this is simply because they're using some debt and investing in preferred equities. You could do that on your own and save the management fees. So the whole point of this video was to show you that it's not all sunshines and rainbows in the REIT sector. I invest the bulk of my net worth in this sector, but it's still very important to be selective. Some REITs may be exceptionally rewarding, but some others could turn into some real disasters. Today, my portfolio includes about 25 REITs in a universe of nearly 1,000 companies. If you want to access my entire real money REIT portfolio, feel free to join High Yield Landlord, which is my REIT newsletter, for a two-week free trial. I will put a link to it in the description of this video. And otherwise, once more, if you could please click the like button. That really helped me a lot to grow this channel. Thank you so much for your support and see you at my next one. Bye-bye.